So here we are, Blue Lake Public Radio. In the middle of nowhere, we have this radio station. Wow, look at this. It's great. Hi. How are you? Oh. Holy, I think I heard him say. Yeah, I think we yeah. have, what time is our? Three o'clock. Of course, this being a classical music station, we have a rare opportunity to talk to you about okay. all of that stuff, too. So so you lead and... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just lead and we'll see where it goes. I'm sure it'll be... But if I go off on a tangent, you'll rein me in, right? <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> That's the fun of it. So yeah. let's go in. Okay, great. And you too. Okay. I so, I don't know, what do you think in terms of good angle? Right there, good, you think? This is gonna look like Howard Stern. Yeah, right, that's what we <laughs> go for. Fine. Yeah. Okay, we're three minutes away. Let's try it just with talking, and see okay. how that goes. So, this is a test, this is only a test. Were this a real broadcast, we would be given more information on where to go and what to mm -hmm. do. <clears throat> The legendary, the legendary Jacqueline Dupre on the cello, recorded with the Philadelphia Orchestra, and recorded back in nineteen, early nineteen seventies. There, nineteen seventy, in fact, November of the year, the Academy of Music in Philadelphia, with her then husband Daniel Dern Barenboim on the podium. With the Philadelphia Orchestra, Jacqueline Dupre on the cello, we heard the opening two sections, the Adagio and Lento, of Jacqueline Dupre's great signature work, the Cello Concerto by Sir Edward Elgar. And with that, we open our three o'clock hour. This is Foley Schuler. Glad to have your company for classical music on this Tuesday afternoon, and I hope you can stay tuned. We'll be hearing more from the Philadelphia Orchestra a little bit later in the hour under the direction of the legendary Leopold Stokowski. And Jacqueline Dupre, of course, one of the most brilliant and fiery, passionate soloists on the cello in the history of the instrument, a career and life cut tragically short by multiple sclerosis. It's our great pleasure to welcome into the studio today a renowned cellist who has performed for many years with the Philadelphia Orchestra and who himself has battled and surmounted the disease of MS and tells the tale in his book, When the Music Stopped, My Battle and Victory Against MS. It's our great pleasure and honor to have with us in the studio today, Bob Cafaro. So great to see you. Thank you thank, for coming. Thank you, Foley. Thank you for having me here today. Absolutely. And it's, it's such a wonderful story. There's so many ways into it and things to talk about. So we'll have to get right into it. But uh, before we, we get to uh, some of the, uh, the medical aspects of, of your journey, uh, I'd really like to just talk about the cello and how did you fall in love with this instrument and how did it become a part of your life? I'm a, sort of an unusual case. I actually am not from a musical family. I started cello at the age of nine in the public school system in Long Island, New York mm -hmm. State, as a matter of fact. And uh, I just something I picked up pretty quickly in the beginning and uh, I guess I wasn't that serious about it. I didn't have that environment that was conducive to classical music at the home. And uh, I actually started playing the guitar around the sure. seventh grade, and I got very serious about that, playing rock bands. Okay, and, so uh, we're talking like rock and pop Yeah, that music. was my culture. Three uh, Chords you know, and the Truth. You name it, you know, Led Zeppelin, Blue Oyster Cult, uh, you know, these That was Santana, a good era for yeah, guitar. Yeah, these, yeah. Were, these were the bands focused. These were my favorite bands. And I, I found myself gravitating toward the, the bands that utilized the classical music focus, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Exactly. Just took and the words and out I was really drawn back, uh, I guess, in my around the age of 16, I discovered the cello again and became self-motivated and decided to How did that my discovery life. come about with the cello? I, there was a program uh, upstate New York, there still, it still exists, it's called the School of Orchestral Studies uh, for New York State residents and it's a four-week program where you go and study with members of the Philadelphia Orchestra okay. and uh, I, I went there and it just changed my life forever. Mm -hmm. And I actually took two lessons with the principal cellist, Bill Stoughton, the former cellist, sure. former principal, and uh, he basically, uh, you know, read me the riot act and told me if I got really serious about the instrument, I could be a very serious, accomplished cellist. So that was all I needed to hear. 
So that's where it yeah. really started in terms yeah, of the cello. For right. You. So the die was cast from that moment in my life. Absolutely. So. And uh, and uh, the die was cast that you would eventually play in the Philadelphia Orchestra yourself. For yeah, many, I mean many that years. that to me was a fantasy too good to become true. Absolutely. That, you know, right. here I Dream studied with true. these people; they were my heroes, and then the next thing I know, I'm one of their colleagues. Now, how did that come about? I know 1985, mid-80s we're talking about. Right, sure. You know, I mean, so. getting into the Philadelphia Orchestra is not an easy task by any means. It's, you, know, you audition, when I auditioned, there were 150 people right. going for that one spot. You can think of your chances. But uh, boy, I, I worked, you know, really devoted the, ta the hours, the, the discipline, everything else. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, of course, we, we listen to the Philadelphia Orchestra all the time here on Blue Lake Public Radio. They're one of our go-to groups, mm -hmm. of course. Whenever there's a choice uh, amongst many of uh, different works, you can always trust the Philadelphia. Of course, the, the famed is the Philadelphia Sound. Oh, yeah. You know, so you were a part of that. Well, and yeah, are a part I, had, of that. I had played with some really top-level groups. I played with the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra for uh, a year and a half. I played with the Baltimore Symphony for... Uh, a few months and then I got into Philadelphia and I'll never forget the first rehearsal I went to I just sat in the middle of this glorious sound and I thought to myself wow I wish they made a stereo system that sounded like this because I would buy it in a heartbeat yeah and this is a, a rare relatively rare opportunity to have somebody from the Philadelphia Orchestra here in our studio so we can maybe deconstruct a little bit about what is it what is that Philadelphia sound? What sets it apart from other orchestras? Uh, well, a, as a string player, I could tell so you've you... you've been right uh, in the middle of it. Yeah, I could tell you probably a, maybe a bit of a biased opinion, sure. but uh, yeah. I, the strings to me are just uh, an, a cut above. They're really exceptional, all the string players. And, and we're just speaking of you specifically. Here. Well, of course. Yeah, of but, course. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> all these string players that basically get accepted as members of the Philadelphia Orchestra, they're all equally as good as any soloist out there. Mm -hmm. They're just, it's mind-blowing to play with these people, how good they are. Yeah, everybody, every chair. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny, so you know, someone step. someone in the, in, in the back of this first or second violin says, oh, do you want to play string quartet for this thing? I say, great. And you hear these people play, and it's like, whoa, they are so good, and you had no idea. Yeah. They, they could easily be the next soloist. They're all so good. Exactly. And it's not just the strings. It's all the, the wind players, you know, the, a lot of really designer players, as I say. That's a good way to put it. And you've, of course, performed with some of the great conductors, you know, Oh, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Oh, over the years, uh, everybody from uh, Ricardo Muti, right. Wolfgang Savalish, yeah. I mean, all these... Uh, Eugen Jochum, Simon uh, Rattle, I mean, you yeah. name it, the, the very, very best, the cream of the crop. Yeah. And uh, so an extraordinary life in music in the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra. We could do a whole hour plus just on that, of course. But your life would take a dramatic turn in the 1990s when you would receive a, a diagnosis that would change your life. But sure. Tell us uh, about that moment. Yeah, just to you know, give you a quick summary, in 1998, I just turned 40. I started getting a strange numbness in my right That's leg. That's when you first... Yeah, and I didn't missed. think any... You know, I, I, I stepped off the stage. My right leg collapsed from under me one day. It was uh, a little worrisome. I saw family doctor, orthopedic surgeon. They both mm -hmm. surmised, well... Probably a pinched nerve, nothing to worry about. Uh, two months later, I start losing peripheral vision in my left eye, mm -hmm. which becomes a, a very alarming textbook sign of a disease that you don't want to deal with. I saw my first neurologist, and he said, you have MS. Mm -hmm. And, oh, whoa, you know, that was, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And, of course, you know Jacqueline Dupre, obviously, right. and that was my only knowledge That's of the, the disease. That's the reference point. For a lot of, you, especially you where music is. Yeah, you could imagine a cellist, professional Cello cellist class. in the Philadelphia Orchestra being told, well, you have MS. So, you know, denial was a river in Egypt. I just didn't want to believe this. Uh, two yeah. months after that, they found three small lesions in the spinal cord. Uh, every other disease had been ruled out. Mm -hmm. um, I still didn't want to believe it. And then uh, July of 1999, I started losing peripheral vision in my right eye, which was scary because the left eye had never recovered completely. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, I got an intravenous steroids. That settled things down for about a week, and then I came down with what I thought was a stomach bug, but it didn't go away. It persisted for a week. I wound up being hospitalized for severe dehydration. Uh, I got out of the hospital four days later. I was pretty much blind in both eyes. I couldn't move my hands. I could hardly walk. I was incontinent. 
uh, you name it, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards, hearing helicopters, my body felt like it was getting electrical current. I could had no physical strength, and I go to my neuro-ophthalmologist, fail a basic vision test, a visual field test, and he tells me, I'll write you a note for permanent disability. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here I am worried about uh, you know, my colleagues in the orchestra hearing that I had MS to the point where my life is over. And I just decided at that point, no, this is not happening. I'm going to find my own answers to this incurable illness. Mm. So, you know, basically, uh, to fast forward, there's a story of a tractor trailer that gets stuck under an overpass and structural engineers are brought in to either raise the overpass or dig grooves in the pavement. and. They're thinking about it. This six-year-old boy comes along on his bicycle and says, Hey, mister, why don't you just let the air out of the tires? Mm -hmm. So, you know, he has an advantage because he doesn't know what's impossible. He has no exactly. training. So I decided to go back to being six years old again, and I'm going to find answers. That's that, the key to so much is not knowing what the limitations are. What's exactly. Impossible. Right. So basically, this six-year-old boy inside me showed me how to let the air out of the tires mm -hmm. of this disease. I found a whole slew of answers. So what was the first letting of the air out? First thing I found was a website called The Water Cure, written by a doctor. I started drinking half my body weight in ounces of water a day. I started seeing my first signs of improvement. I started uh, looking at MS rates around the world, uh, you know, places I'd been to, Japan, very low rates, your very poorest nations have your lowest rates, uh, the Okinawa Centenarian study. Mm. I started living on a very you know, low calorie natural diet, uh, everything I used, experiences from my childhood, things I had read, uh, the U.S. Army Survival Guide about the psychology of mm -hmm. surviving. And I imagine you must have drawn upon all of your all of your powers that made you the great musician you were. Absolutely, yeah, to because, survive. yeah, to, you know, to be in, you know, it, it's funny, my wife thinks I'm partly autistic, maybe Asperger's, but that enables one to basically withdraw from the world and to focus very intently mm -hmm. on whatever needs to be done. So here I, you know, devoted a lot of time to research. Absolutely. And, you know, looked at other things, the placebo effect, learned some secrets of it through meditation. I followed examples of people who accomplished the impossible. And uh, I would, yeah, that, that's a perfect leading because I was just going to mention uh, a big part of all of this are some very important inspirations, mentors, people who inspired you in this, Absolutely. from all different fields, from from music to baseball to uh, you name it. There, there have been some very specific uh, mentors that helped, that were l guiding lights for you. Really. Sure, absolutely. I mean, you can go back to your basic example of uh, Roger Bannister, the first human being mm -hmm. to run a mile in less than four minutes. They said it was impossible. Now it's an achievable goal. Bobby Fischer, on his own, not, doesn't just win a chess match against the Soviet master, he beats an entire nation, an entire culture on his own. Nolan Ryan, the athlete who staves off the aging process for 25 years, throws his no-hitter at the age of 44. And then, you know, my favorite is Nando Parado, who survived the famous right. crash in the Andes Mountains in 1972. That's, that's the story told in the, the classic best-selling book, Alive. That right. A lot of so I, I met him in 2013, yeah. and I had a chance to thank this man for being one of my guides. And, and, and I, uh, I know an, another one that, that you describe actually as a spiritual guide is uh, is Bill Goltz, if I'm pronouncing his name right. Absolutely, yeah. And tell us about him, because I know this he plays an important role on a lot of levels, including uh, regarding the instrument that we have here with us that you're hold, holding. Sure, your well, uh, hands I mean, this, you know, part of my approach to finding answers to this incurable illness was to not immerse myself in self pity. So I started doing a lot of volunteer and outreach work, playing at mm -hmm. you know, retirement communities, nursing homes. I played a recital at a retirement community, and this elderly man uh, shuffled up to me afterward and said, son, you play beautifully, and he told me he had this old cello, he wanted me to see it, and you know, here I shows me this breathtaking instrument, and uh, anyway, the instrument it was just magnificent, and he had purchased this instrument in 1951, and he had it for almost 60 years, and it was actually owned by Pia Gregor Piatigorsky, wow. the great cellist who yeah, played with absolutely. Yasha Heifetz. Yeah. And he's had it all that time, and uh, basically his, Bill Goltz, his time was approaching, and he wanted to personally select the next caretaker for this instrument. So I'm entrusted with this for my lifetime mm -hmm. now, and uh, the instrument is now enjoying its 200th birthday. It was made in Venice, Italy. 
Oh, that's right, 1816. Yeah, and it was yeah. made by uh, Yannick to Santa Giuliana in mm. 1816. Yeah, so, this might be a perfect segue to maybe uh, hear a little bit on the instrument. And you know, I think I think uh, the microphone should be uh, be okay if we just leave it where it is. Or okay, we can just maybe take it down just a shade. Yeah, just take it down a little bit there. Okay. And uh, the magic so, of live radio here. Good. We so, have Bob Cafaro with his great Venetian instrument uh, here in the studio today. Okay, so I know we're short on time. I'll just play one of the uh, one of the gavats from the Bach cello suites, uh, and this is uh, the one of the gavats from the sixth suite in D major. Fantastic. in the studio today, Bob Cafaro on cello, performing the gavotte from the Suite for Unaccompanied Cello Number no. 6 by Johann Sebastian Bach, the great extraordinary master. It's described as a symphony for the cello, and uh, so great to have that performed in our studio on your beloved uh, 1816 uh, instrument. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually owe a word of gratitude to uh, Alicia Hake, Hake of... Uh, of MS Champs here because I met her actually on social media mm -hmm. about uh, six months ago and she had read about my story and apparently was very taken up and said what would it take to get you out here and the next thing I know I'm here and my cello came out with me and uh, they were just yeah, amazing so Alicia set this up with uh, with Mercy Health, and it's it's just been an amazing few days that I've been it's here. It's so great to have you here, and and, uh, and our thanks to her as well uh, for for the work she does with MS Champs, and uh, they have uh, groups that meet uh, both in uh, Byron Center and right here in Muskegon as well, and uh, we appreciate the work she's doing, and uh, she's the one that uh, put us in contact as well for you to come out here. So uh, we're delighted by that. And so great to have you uh, here in the studio performing and speaking about this remarkable story about really uh, what's possible uh, with determination and just uh, when the spirit is right to uh, do the impossible, uh, overcoming uh, the disease of MS. You are now, uh, it is uh, believed, uh, sim symptom free. Well, um, in 1999, when I had at my lowest point, when I couldn't move my hands, I was blind, I, everything, I had a complete series of MRIs done, 
and I had over 50 active lesions in my brain and my spinal cord had one lesion that was three and a half centimeters in length. And it was funny after I met Nando Parado and he, this giant gave me a hug, I, mm. I somehow, it, it was strange, but something went through me and I felt like I had cured myself with everything I had done with diet, with you know hydration, exercise, meditation everything and I went back to my neurologist for the first time in 11 years I had done everything on my own and he did a complete series of MRIs and my brain and spinal cords show no lesions now Rock. and I've regained the use of my hands my eyes everything obviously <laughs> listening to that yeah. cello music just now so and uh, it's it's a fantastic story and you're the, the first to, to point out in your book and elsewhere that this is a, a study of one absolutely and uh, but uh, but doctors have been uh, have been inspired by your example. Absolutely, like. the one uh, the head of neuro ophthalmology at Will's Eye Hospital is, as a matter of fact, the one who told me that I would be on permanent disability. He's actually recommending my book to his patients now because, you know, he says that neurology and medicine are somewhat limited with what they can do. You know, they have mm -hmm. the latest drug and they can monitor people, but, you know, here. Other answers were offered that uh, that luckily the six-year-old boy showed me. Absolutely, so, yeah, it's important so. to listen to that six the six-year-old boy in all of yeah. us. So you know, it, it yeah. was quite a project writing the whole book. You know, I self-published it. I did it myself. I basically I have uh, you know my own distribution network through mm -hmm. my website uh, www.bobcafaro.com. Yeah, all sorts of information there so. about about this uh, remarkable story. And the book is a fascinating read. It's when the Music Stopped, My Battle and Victory Against MS by cellist Bob Cafaro. And it's been such a pleasure. It's so great to have you here in West Michigan, and we wish you well on all your endeavors. Thank you so much for being here. Thank with you, us. Foley. Great. That was marvelous.